creating a culture of love. It's so hard to take a step back and being like, you know what, they're wrong. What is the thought of reincarnation then? It's tough, I will say, because it's, it's really heavy. I, and I think people think I have a switch I could turn on and off. And it's like, I'm human, just like the next person. Do you like look at me and say, hey, there's a dead guy on the left, on the right? Yeah. What do these symbols look like? Is it like if I close my eyes in a movie and you see hieroglyphics and neon as special effects? Jonathan Mark, welcome to the studio. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming in. I think it was a hairy trip, right? A little bit, a little bit. Tropical storms are happening on both sides. Yeah, but yeah. But you got here. I did. A little, uh, a little bumpy and mm -hmm. a little long, but I got here and it was nice. So without you know going too much in what do you do, but like first, what's the difference between a psychic and a medium? Mm -hmm. And is it all bullshit, right? That's what people want to know. <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. 100%. And, um, so the first part of the question is a psychic, I think it's people that kind of view the future, and that's what they do. So mm. they just view that. That's what. That's how they read. And a medium talks to the past. So anything that has like family, friends that passed away, past tense. So I try to tell people, I'm like, psychic, future tense, medium, past tense. And as far as it being bullshit or not... Um, <laughs> I would definitely say it's not, but I tell people that they have to experience it for themselves mm -hmm. in order to make that decision. So I say, sit down with me for five, 10 minutes privately, like do what you got to do mm -hmm. and then make a decision from there. And that's what I tell literally every single person because everyone has their beliefs. And that's fair. I mean, you can kind of apply that to anything in life. Right. Like, I'll make you lose 100 pounds. I will get you stronger. Right. I will be the life coach that gets you to the <laughs> right. next level. Right. Allow me to have the opportunity to be your medium. Right. And I always tell people, just like, allow me the opportunity to show you, mm -hmm. like, through action and through experience versus, like, hearing it from X, Y, and Z. Just, like, sit down with me. And then you draw your own conclusion. Yeah. Don't have someone else draw it for you. And like that's a, what I just try to tell people. Like a movie review. I'm like, I'm <laughs> yeah. going to go watch it. Your reviews, your, that's your taste. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But... You know, there's a lot of snake oil out there. You, mm -hmm. you go around, you see, read your tarot cards. Yeah. Like you see stuff yeah. and it's usually like kind of like a ghetto looking place <laughs> with a lot of neon lights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, and you're paying all this money mm -hmm. and you see that it's like a lot of desperate people go mm -hmm. to these places. Yeah. Um, where does that fit in in, in in what you're doing or how do people find you? So originally, I it was only word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Like I never wanted to have like that shop on the corner never wanted to have at first i really didn't want social media i was like really against it and i wanted my i guess gift or ability to speak for itself versus me going on social media and promoting promoting mm -hmm. promoting then obviously eventually people are like you need to get on social media that's like where we are but i i truly just you know believe that you know where it all kind of lines up is people do go to those places when they're very desperate and they want answers mm -hmm. And I try my best just where I fall is, you know, if you want to come to me, that's great. But I'm not like trying to like pull you in, reel you in, like you come when you're ready. Yeah. And I'm not going to chase anyone for that, like, because it is very vulnerable and people do come when they're hurting at their lowest, lowest point. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be come like sleazy, snaky and be like, why don't you come here and let me change your life bro, yeah. or whoever. Right. And that's what I kind of lean on. It's just like, when you're ready, you come to me. I will mm -hmm. never like reach out to you about it. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that because I've had low moments in my life where people are like, hey, my aunt does this or this. Yeah. Or that. And you're like, you know what? Why not? At this <laughs> yeah. point, why yeah. not? Right. But on the highest of highs, you're not also thinking, let me go into this space and tap into it unless you're just right. curious. Right. But uh, hold on. I got this good question I want to go <laughs> to. <clears throat> this is what happens when I have questions and I'm preparing to make it extra special for you and Jen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so just tell me like when did you know that you had this gift and then what were the steps or the crossroads that said hey i'm gonna pursue this i'm gonna lean into it because i'm assuming you know on the rare occasion i get those goosebumps or feel something and that's why i believe in a lot of different things right. i would have been terrified if i knew this was something 
Yeah, so basically when I was a kid, um, making a long story shorter, my aunt passed away when I was six months old. Mm -hmm. And obviously with family members, you, me, everyone, there's pictures that you know family members put up so mm -hmm. you could be like, I remember, blah, 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 whoever. So when I was a kid, I'd be like, Aunt Sue is here. And that was my mom's sister who passed and they were best, best friends. My mom's like, yeah, that's cute. Like there's pictures here, there's pictures there. We talk about her every day. Mm -hmm. So Easter came around and my grandfather, when he was still here, my uh, their father, I walked up to, they were all sitting in a group. I mean, this is what my mom told me. I was so young, I was about four. And she goes, Aunt Sue's grabbing a jean jacket. Like she's squeezing it tight and thanking you. And my grandfather goes, what the hell is this kid talking about? Like, what's he saying? Like, that makes no sense. My mom turns like white like a ghost mm. and starts like hysterically crying. And my grandfather's like, why are you crying? What does that mean? So my mom gathered everyone. She's like, when the funeral happened, um, everyone left to go to the cars to drive to the cemetery. My mom and my aunt lived together until she passed. She had cancer. And when she was healthy, they would steal clothes back and forth from each other. Mm. And there was just one jean jacket that they would steal back and forth from each other. And when everyone left, my mom just like walked back in and she put the jean jacket in the casket. So when she was buried, she would be warm. And Whoa. she didn't tell my other aunt, her, their, her other sister, she wanted to be private and personal. So no one knew. So then my mom's crying and she's like, the hell like like how the hell did this kid know this so then as years went on i was seeing more things and it, it was a blessing and a curse and the reason why i actually say this is because i learned so much about my family that i wish i never learned about mm. and um just learning situations from family member to family member that are as, as worse as you can get and being a young kid saying things like that and then growing up and mm. realizing what those things mean was really tough so then I was like, I'm done with this, like, because it scared me. And as I got older, I wanted to play sports, hang out with my friends, do mm -hmm. that stuff. So I'm like, I'm not going to pay attention. But it kept getting like wider and wider as far as like the funnel, I guess I can call it. And then when I was going off to college, I was like, I turned to my mom the night before and I was like, is there mental illness in the family? Mm. And she goes, and she looked at me and she's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, I think I'm schizophrenic. I don't really know what's going on. Like I'm seeing things. I mean, you know, I don't really know what it is. And my mom's like, there's no signs of mental illness in the family. And she's like, coincidentally, I'm going to a medium in three months. And I was going away to college. And she's like, do you want me to ask her? Mm. So for me, I don't know about anyone, I don't know about you, but when I was younger, I thought mediums and like psychics, like crazy hair, the big nails, like yeah. creepy as heck. Like, like a you know? voodoo doctor yeah. or something. Yeah. So I was like, who is this person and what is she going to say, you know, as far as like whatever. So she goes and the medium was like, listen, your kid could be crazy. I have no freaking clue. Like bring him to me when he comes home. So I go to her when I come back from winter break and... I walk in and she goes, holy crap, I've never seen someone this like gifted before, like kind of like developed at like a younger age. Mm -hmm. And she's like, do you want to learn? And I was like, no. And she's <laughs> like, really? I was like, no. And so I leave and she goes, well, if you do, here's like my number, give me a call. So I'm leaving and I'm like, ah, shit. I'm like, I should have done it. You know, it's like one of those things where I was like, I should have done it. I was scared. I didn't want... Really, honestly, a big portion of it was judgment from my family and friends mm -hmm. about it. So that was a huge thing for me, like in the back of my head on top of what she said, was, which was like validating and scary at the same time. So then literally I call her up. She like trains me. And when I say train, because people always ask me to like, what, what does that entail? And what does that mean? Yeah, it's I not like hill sprints and <laughs> stretching. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, it's none of that. She would just sit me down and be like, read this person, right? And what basically what it was, was she was helping me interpret a language in my head that I didn't know what it was. So if I was seeing symbols, I was like, I don't know what it means. And she would kind of help me interpret it in my head. Mm. So she was reading the public for about eight to 10 years at that point. I caught up to her like skill level, whatever, you know, people want to call it at like six months. And she's like, I can't really help you because she's Beyond like, this. you kind of like caught up to me and the she's like is, 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 is surpassed the mentor <laughs> exactly, or whatever. Yeah. exactly and she's like you know kind of do this on your own now so my mom was a key component in this and she was bringing in 
um, like friends of friends that I've never met that were open to it. So I was able to like kind of practice on the side and do, you know, be a normal college kid and do this on the side. But I didn't tell my friends till I was like in my mid to late twenties. Like I, I honestly was very afraid. Like of I tell people it was mm-hmm. like coming out of the medium closet. Honestly, <laughs> like it's fair, right? Yeah. And, I mean, just to pause you there and interject because there's a few fears Please. in the world, right? Yeah. It's like the fear of failing. Yep. Some people have it. That's the thing. It's yep. not mine. The fear of succeeding. Some people have that. Yep. And that's a thing. That's one that's not mine. But in my other buddy, we talk about this a lot. There's the fear of judgment. What do people think of us? Mm -hmm. So that's what I hear came on through you. And I think that's a lot of, I think that's a very male fear often. Yes. And you're probably thinking, well, I don't want to come off as crazy. Right. I'm never going to have a girlfriend. What is this going to look like? And at that age, you know, I remember me in my 20s is I need more money. I need to show off all these things I had to buy. It was all about ego. So you had this consistent battle with your ego. Mm -hmm. But at what point did you just say, I'm going to shut that self-doubt up and that voice and that fear and really lean into this? Because it's not like, hey, I'm going to go start a business. You're leaning into something that a lot of people totally write off. Right. And the most of the world is skeptic to it. Right. And you're like, well, I'm going to lean into this gift. Do you remember what that was? Or Yeah, I do. There there was like two, two moments. There was one moment when... I was doing it on the side and I like like I said I didn't have social media and my wait list kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and there was no social media no me going on a radio show none of that and it was all word of mouth and yeah. then I was like at at that point I was like okay people you know clearly like had a good experience I guess I will say and it's you know people keep referring people so I was like that's you know cool Actually, there's a couple moments. And then when I read an NFL player and a UFC fighter that were both obviously males, because in the beginning, I think people think it's very female dominated for mm-hmm. like my clients. And it's for me, it's 50 50. I read just as much males as females. And that was something big, too, to see this six foot eight offensive lineman come into my house. It's a big s- dude. Yeah. Sit down look at me like he wanted to rip my face off in the beginning and then at the end was hugging me and like squeezing me and he's like Mm. like you know like those types of moments where i'm like okay like if he is comfortable to do that then i should be as well and when i was helping out i guess with law enforcement too that gave me a little bit more courage to be like all right i'm doing this if people can say this is bs but I'm like, look what I'm doing. I'm helping these unsolved cases, these missing people, all this. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a couple different things that happened within like a year span of each other, like within the same year, but in the span of year. And then eventually I'm like, I can't hide this. Like I'm going to dive into this. Like, so basically you kept saying yes to the universe. Kind of. Yeah. I kept like, I was trusting it, being fearful of it, but trusting it at the same time. And I use this term, which is like, um, I think, it's it applies to me with a lot of things it's like i'm always cautiously optimistic Mm -hmm. so i'm i always think of the good but i'm always like you know something could happen which will ruin that good for me and i think that's a big downfall for me if i'm being Mm -hmm. honest because i'm already setting a precedent that i'm accepting some type of failure Mm -hmm. and i'm putting it being like you know if i fail like at least i knew something was gonna fail like in my head which i've come to realize as i got older was a problem yeah, there's, that's a fear-based scarcity mindset. Yeah. That's a limiting belief that you started yeah. creating. Yeah. Do you think there's a story wrapped in that? Something that happened that led you to that? Yeah, I, I honestly think it all ties back into when I was playing sports, when I was you know doing stuff like that. Because when I was younger, you know, people always said I couldn't do a lot. Like I was really skinny, really tiny. Mm-hmm. So like I wanted to play football, which I did. I wrestled and played lacrosse. Those are my three sports. And my coaches would be like, this kid's too small. Like, he can't do this. Mm -hmm. And then I would believe him because I'd be like, you know, these guys are adults. They're, you know, my coaches, they're saying I can't do this. And my father, I love him to death, best guy in the world. He's one of those people that are very quiet, right? Mm -hmm. He just absorbs what's going on. So he wasn't, he was telling me I can do it, but it wasn't like... um, It wasn't louder than what the rest of the people were telling Yeah, it wasn't louder than the other parents, right? Like I see the other parents on the side, like screaming at their kids, being like, you got this, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. My dad's sitting there, you know, smiling and happy and quiet, which is why I love him so much. And... 
But when my coaches that were coaching me saying this, I honestly believed them. And that just translated into a lot of things for mm-hmm. me with that. And I wasn't good at school. Teachers told me I wasn't going to go to college. You know, I wasn't going to do well in college. Mm-hmm. And that also, like, messed me up a little bit, too. Yeah. That, that can, as a kid, I mean, all that plays a toll. And it's up to us to really start trying to figure out how to get out of that. It's so tough because yeah. I feel like when it's in, ingrained in your head and you're hearing it from the people that you look up to and the people that are supposed to be your like role models, it's so hard to take a step back and being like, you know what, they're wrong. Because I believe like this guy went to the NFL, this guy wrestled D1 in college, this guy played lacrosse. And I was just like, you know, these guys know everything and they went to the highest levels and when they said that to me, I was like, well, if they're saying that, then there has to be some truth to it. And that's when I kind of, for a few years, I took a step back and then I was like, you know what? Screw this. I went to the gym, you know, put on like a bunch of weight and everything changed from there, but it still was in the back of my mind. Like I changed Mm -hmm. everything and it still was like, I'm not good enough, Mm. which was crazy. But makes sense i think to me looking back at it yeah but that's part of your story yeah i mean in your craft no one can tell you you're not good enough at what you do only you can do it maybe someone else have you met anyone more powerful than you or or that (laughs) next person to take you to that next level yeah so this guy john edwards he's on long island too he found me when i was like a teenager Mm -hmm. because he heard of word of mouth of things with me and you know at that time too i was like dude, like, I'm not ready for this. I don't want my friends to know. I don't want even some of my extended family to know Mm -hmm. because I had issues with them too with this of, like, religion and things like that. And he's the one person that I'm, like, blown away by. Like, he went through, like, hell to get to where he is. Like, he told me what I should do when I was a kid. I didn't listen to him. And when I started doing it, I'm like, I'm listening to this guy. And that's why I had no social media. That's why I used to drive to people's homes for Mm. appointments. I used to go to do these group readings with six, seven people with with, walking with a backpack, with a hat on, Mm -hmm. do my thing, walk out. And people are like, who the heck is this kid? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and he's a guy that I idolize in this field. And he made a name for himself by proof. And I mean, yes, there's obviously people that are like, this is BS and stuff, which is completely fair to their own opinion Mm -hmm. but he's someone who i'm like i will always strive to be like in this type of way Mm. it's good that you have mentors in the space yeah it's always good to look up to somebody yeah it's tough especially in this field so tiny and there are a lot of fake people out there and you know i've witnessed seen been around those people and um it's nice to see someone legitimate and Mm -hmm. doing it out of a place of like factual versus like let me pull in a butterfly that's coming yeah. in and stuff. Like, it's just very factual things. That's yeah. what I like. So, I mean, let's get into it. What's, yeah. the, what's this look like physically? For us that aren't gifted, yeah. that can't tap into that space. Yeah. First, I feel like that, that myth of women versus men, because women are more tapped into their intuition than yes. men. We are more shut off. So I probably think that's why yeah. that's one of those factors that people assume. Yeah. Yep. Um, but, uh, those that are tapped in are are much more open, you know, and we all have that uh, ability to listen to our gut. Yes. But what does this look like? Are you, do you like look at me and say, Hey, there's a dead guy on the left, (laughs) on the right. Yeah. What do these symbols look like? Is it like if I close my eyes in a movie and you see hieroglyphics and neon as special effects? So to go to your first point, everyone can do this, right? It's like I use this reference, everyone can sing, but not everyone can sing like Frank Sinatra. Mm. And I try to say that to people because one, anyone can do this. It's just like, you know, what degree? Yeah. But what I see when I look, the best way I can explain it to people, there's, I started with symbols. So I would look at a blank surface like a wall and they would write the name Ryan, mm-hmm. right? Like in, Imagine if the sun is hitting in through a window on a sunny day and you see that white glow. Yeah. It's not, it's, it just, tur- it morphs into different things when, when I first started. With like the dust in it. Yeah. Or, yeah. So you would see Ryan and then it would disappear, right? Cause like you're supposed to catch it instantly. Then I used to see anchors and I was like Navy, sailor, and then they would put, then it would be like one plus one plus one equals this whole mm. thing. So they share a story. Now when I do it, it's mini screenshots in my head. So they'll relate it to if I, if someone's coming through my, and my fiance's in there, her name is Jess. 
if someone's mother name is Jess, her face will flash really fast in my head, and then next to it will be the cause of death. So they'll put cancer, lung, lung cancer, stage four. Mm. So they do very factual things for me. So it's very screenshots in my head mixed with like things that I can relate to. So they'll put like maybe scenes of movies that were tragic and mm -hmm. I can relate to it or as far as like that goes versus like personal experience and mm. stuff. So it's your own personal like super decoder journal manual. And yeah. Like, doo -doo -doo. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, it's literally like learning your own language and you teaching them and them teaching mm -hmm. you at the same time. It's kind of crazy. Like, and that's why I, I told people in the beginning, it took me a long time when I would do readings to like um, get a bunch of like information that's like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, because they were really training my like eye, third eye, whatever people want to like say. So I'm able to capture that like mm -hmm. fast. So then when you get to a certain level, it's like one, two, three, one, two, three. So you can give people all of this stuff in a short period of time versus me just like go, mm -hmm. like staring like that for a while. So. And is that different for other people? Is everyone's... Yeah. Everyone is different. Like, there's people that are... Um, I'm visual. There's people that can hear. And there's people that, I guess, can see them. I mean, like, when it comes to me seeing them, it's, it's typically features on their body that they want me to, like, say. So, for example, if someone has a scar under their left eye, they would show a scar under their left eye. So, mm. I could be like, your father... Mark is here with a scar under his left eye. And then they're like, oh my God, he had like a scar right there mm. or like a mole or like some type of thing. And then when it comes to like the specifics of them, it would be like the jean jacket. They'll show me like a red flannel mm -hmm. or this that they were buried in and stuff. So that's kind of how they come to me. But mm -hmm. people sometimes will just know, like they'll just be like, I just know the person is blah, 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 blah. And you, I never can discredit it because what works for me may not work for them, but yeah. what works for them probably doesn't work for me. So I'm always open to whatever anyone has to say to teach me. I'm mm -hmm. try, I am try to be like a vessel with that. Yeah, because I'm sitting here thinking how my imagination works. I could look at the ceiling. If there's popcorn ceiling, it's even worse. Like yeah. I just pff, battle scenes. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm yeah, like, I would just yeah. see, I'm thinking like horror dead people yeah. bleeding. I'd be like, I don't want to see what no, you're seeing. No. I'd be terrified. Yeah, it is. it is quite scary. In the beginning, it definitely fried me. I've gotten used to it. It still scares me, though. I'm not going to lie. I'm not, not going to sit here and be like, oh, it doesn't scare me at all. Yeah. No, it definitely fries me a little bit. Because it comes like, they'll, they'll come at you. It's like if I'm looking at you, then the corner of my right eye will flash. And then I'm like, whoa, that just like scared me so mm. much. So I won't lie and say that it doesn't scare me because yeah. it does. No, for sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah. So a little bit ago, you were talking about how it, it created rifts within your family a little bit yeah, because for sure, yeah. because they told you things that are basically in people's heads or amongst them yeah. do they start coming like is it just unfiltered now they're like fuck it i'm dead here it is i have nothing to hide i'm not gonna sugarcoat it like what what is some of that that you were saying yeah so basically when people pass away and they do things that aren't great they always come through and they don't sugarcoat it because they want to they want a stranger, me, whoever that's the medium or whoever, to basically say something that happened in order to give them validity that, one, this is real, but two, to kind of help them close a wound. Because a mm. lot of times people, when they come to me and they have these really intense things, they try to ignore it. Like, they really do. They try to shelf it. It's kind of like stored in the back of their head. And then... I mean, I could tell you there's times where I say things to people, they say, no, no, no. And then at the end, they're like, wait a minute. You're right. My dad did do this to me. I just didn't want to say this to you. And yeah. They're like, it was, they're like, I dealt with this 10 years ago. They're like, it's hard for me to like talk about mm -hmm. it again. And it is very unfiltered because they want to essentially apologize and recognize what they did was wrong mm -hmm. in this life. So they want them to know like, hey, hindsight's 2020. Like I can look at this and be like, this was bad. Like this was not what I should have done in this circumstance and how it affected you 30 years later. Mm -hmm. And that's why I try, I tell people in the, in, in the beginning of readings, honestly, that I think when people come to mediums or people sometimes they think it's like rainbows and unicorns. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say like they're sparkles and you know, yeah, like love. I yeah, say it's exactly. Yeah. And I try to tell people like, I do try to lean into that as much as I possibly can, but life is life. And life sometimes is tough and that stuff will come up 
if it needs to. But mm -hmm. I do try to focus on that. But they do come to me because like it's either they want answers or they want to hear about the love that they have from their families and stuff. So there, so does a lot of it is around closure. Then is it unanswered questions it's, or yeah? I didn't get to say this at the last minute. And then following into that, where are they? Are they in between world? Like yeah. if we take religion into it, is it heaven and hell? Mm -hmm. Is it just another spiritual world? Like mm -hmm. where no, are they? Yeah. yeah. So people do come for answers and they definitely mm -hmm. come for closure. Probably the two biggest things. And obviously there are people that come because they're like, I didn't get to say this mm -hmm. before they passed. And I, I try to tell people that it applies to everyone, if you think about it. Like, I didn't get to say goodbye to a lot of people in my life. And that's what people always want to do is, like, say the goodbye. And I'm like, when they pass away, they don't even focus on that. They focus on your relationship as a whole. Mm -hmm. They don't focus as your last conversation or last interaction. So I want pe I've want i been trying to tell people that so they don't get so hung up on that and they get so depressed that on they the didn't get to, like, yeah, like, get to say goodbye. But... As far as what you're saying about like the two worlds or whatever, I think it's just, I guess, a spiritual world maybe. Um, the heaven and hell thing, I, I don't really know too much about that. I, I, I could definitely speak to you about like what John Edwards told me and like what a bunch of people told me is there's like different levels, right? And there's, I'm going to use this number, there's seven levels. High, the the seventh is like the highest where it's like you don't need to come back. Like you fulfilled what you need to fulfill in your lifetimes mm -hmm. here. And then there's the first level where people typically don't do the greatest things. Mm. And people are like, well, then what's hell, right? And I tell people, I'm like, if you think about hell as the first level, you're watching the people that you affected based on your action of how you passed and the circumstances around it. Mm. And I was like, that's hell. Because if you're, if you're watching them suffer and sitting there crying about what you did like, which was in, you know, kind of your control as far as certain things, I'm like, that's hell to me. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, as you climb that ladder and you're getting to that more at peace, I'm like, that's like heaven. Like, you, you, your family's situated, mm -hmm. you're situated, you're all together. So, like, that's, I try to relate that into, like, the religious aspect of heaven and hell because I, I know from doing stuff with, like, John and... Tyler Henry, we did this thing where I was on the East Coast, someone's on the West Coast, and I think John was in like Australia or, or something. And we read someone in Texas, the same person, but we didn't know. And it was a study from like Johns Hopkins, like one of those people, because I've done it with Johns Hopkins, Columbia, a bunch of places. And mm -hmm. just for people to understand, like they're so open to it and they know what it is like they put electrodes on my head or whatever and they would, they would make me read someone versus a conversation versus a memory mm -hmm. and they would like tell the difference between each one but when we were doing the readings in all different parts of the world we were getting the same things within seconds apart of each other and we weren't even on the same zoom call we were on a different we were all like in a private call so when they were saying that to us they're like it's a spiritual world that can go in the speed of light to be able to give me a message to you, to them, to them within a second. Mm -hmm. And when they told me that after, I was, I have to be honest, I like couldn't wrap my head around it. Yeah. I was like, whoa, like that's scary. It's like, yeah. it's cool. It's cool. So they could literally go from place to place to place. I find it so cool. But the fact that the science is also just actually validating you, right? That was a huge thing for me. That was just like another side of like validity for what I do. Mm -hmm. Having these brilliant minds come and be like yeah like we need to understand more about how you guys can do this mm -hmm. and they told me that there's a bean part in my brain that when i do readings it just starts pulsating and like amplifies and when and when that happens that's when the other parts of my brain kind of quiet out and that channels it in to focus right because like when you do readings i tell people you really have to blank your mind out it's an art like you have to go into it take your personal stuff aside and drop that and then just blank your mind out. That's why when I do readings, I always stare down or I look up because I'm staring at a blank surface. So, yeah. I'm, so I'm able to just to completely blank my mind out. So mm. it's, it's kind of so crazy. So curious, do you meditate then? And what happens during meditation for <laughs> yeah, you? Yeah. So um, I try. It, my mind races so fast, but I... At, but, Literally before every single reading, I meditate. Mm. I'll do it for about 10 to 15 minutes. And basically what it is, is when I meditate, 
you know, it's, it's going to sound silly, but it's just what I do, and it, and it works for me. But I play Maya and Sue's favorite song mm-hmm. over on repeat, Madonna Crazy For You. Mm-hmm. I just play that over on repeat. Very not a manly song, but... Um, and then I kind of get into this place where I go into, like, a forest, and I'm able to kind of, like, see, like, what's happening. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times before readings... I'll be able to know who's coming through based on me meditating. So Mm. it's like when I meditate, I'll see a name, Anthony. And then I may not know the relationship, but then when they sit down and I get in that zone, I'm able to see the relationship Mm. of Anthony. And a lot of times people, I think, come and they want to hear from a certain person and another person comes through because they have a more important message to deliver Mm -hmm which is like the example of like the father coming through. She wanted someone else, but the father was coming through because he needed to get that, you know, try to make right somewhat of his wrongs. Yeah. And yeah, it's, I tell people you don't want to be in my mind for like an hour. It's not, it's exhausting. Yeah. It's exhausting. Interesting. So talking back to these levels of spirit, yeah. spirit life or world or whatever, is what is the thought of reincarnation then? Mm. Have you experienced any of that? Is there validity to it? I know there's different yeah. religions and teachings yeah. that believe we keep coming back until we're complete and that's the soul is ex- complete. We ascend to. That's literally exactly it. So basically, people are like, "How can you connect to my great grandfather?" Which I try not to, unless you had a relationship with them or there's some type of thing that needs to be brought up, and then he's back. So I tell people, it's exactly what you said. It's like when they reach that certain point, they don't have to come back. But a lot of the times when they do come back, a piece of their soul will stay there. That's how I'm able to connect to great grandfather Michael, right? Mm -hmm. Like, but the the 98% of him is back. And that's, I do believe in that. I've, you know, through readings and stuff, I truly believe in that. And I think people view being here on earth as hell like that's what i literally hear from every single person they're like they're like that's not hell this is hell and Mm. i'm like maybe but i'm like i don't think so i'm like based on what i do i'm like that first level to me seems a lot like hell watching that but i definitely think the reincarnation is very real and i think that people just have a misconception of it. Like they feel like that, that soul will go and then comes back and it's a full circle. It's like kind of, but a piece of them will stay there because this, this life was important to them or just in general. So that small piece stays, that's how I'm able to connect to them. But the vast majority of that comes through. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a picture of my grandfather. I look identical to him. I look identical to him and he, he passed when I was like five, like, and people are like, you know, is that reincarnation? I'm like, probably not, because he was here when I was born. But mm. the way that it just works is just like so, I can't even explain yeah. it. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. So have you ever sat down with someone that you just cannot read? <laughs> um, knock on wood. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have not. I have sat down with people that, like, I, I think the biggest thing is they expect a certain person to come through and mm-hmm. that person does not come through. So they become very defensive and they become very, like, this is not what I wanted. So it's like, I've had that before where like people want to hear from someone, but someone else comes through, which is their expectation coming in, which isn't fair to you either. Exactly. Like, and that's kind of what I tell them. I'm like, you expected to hear from this, but your best friend that you were with in the car that passed away is coming through Mm -hmm. that, you know, wants to tell you this. It's like, I don't know how you like, like why you think this was a bad experience or whatever. And then they take a second and they realize that I'm, you know, essentially right and that they ruined an entire reading because they were being combative the entire Mm -hmm. time it's like you just accepted that your best friend was coming through like we would have had a completely different type of reading instead of me trying to prove to you this 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 Mm -hmm. and this like the entire time so no i want to talk to Susie. sorry johnny's here (laughs) exactly it's like it's like your best friend's here that you're in the car with and you survived and he didn't right and they like suppress it and they don't want to talk about it. It was a memory for them that they struggle with, but they want to come through to talk to you because it was traumatic on mm-hmm. them. But people will be like, nah, I'm good. Like, I want Grandma Sally to come through or something. Then yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. So you said something earlier. You have to, at some point in your life, have a connection to this person to then go hear from them again? Or can you, like, go... Mm-hmm. 
super far back into the ancestries. And yeah, so there's one story that this would be the first time I'm saying it, I, I, actually. But I read someone who works in a museum, right? And so freaking weird. But I kept saying this weird name, like this name I couldn't pronounce. Mm -hmm. And the girl's like, what the hell are you talking about? Literally, the next day I get an email and she's like, wait a minute. She goes, the mummy from blah, 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 blah. His name is blah, 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 blah. And she goes, I've been working on this like thing for the past six months. And she goes, you were talking about, like I was talking about something with the fingers and like you'll f discover like, blah, 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 like something with the fingers. And she goes, you were talking about the fingers and all of his fingers were gone. And with all the mummies, typically their fingers are like present in there. Mm -hmm. And she goes, and then you said it would be in a different part of his body and I said, I'm like, yeah, it's going to be in his right thigh. And all the fingers were in his right thigh. And she was like, you know, that's kind of weird. And I was like, yeah, tell me about it. I'm like, that was my first time where I went back ancestor to ancestor. Like, but it wasn't even her ancestor. It was just yeah, like a mummy. Like just the that mummy's like, yo, put my fingers back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could you just put it back where they're supposed to be? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, why are they in my thigh? That's <laughs> like, interesting. Yeah. yeah. It was weird. That tripped me out. I'm not going to lie. That definitely tripped me out a little bit. But I guess I can't be too freaked out about this. Yeah, this. I mean, it's probably hard to scare you. But if you do get scared, I probably don't want to be in the room with you mm -mm. if you really get, <laughs> like, turn ghost white. I've done that. Yeah, I've done that where... Um, so people always ask me, is, is there, like, negative energies, right? Like, And I always tell people that a negative energy, from my perspective, is a bad person that lived on this earth that doesn't want to change, right? Like there's people that are bad that are asking for forgiveness and there's people that are bad that are themselves, which is why they stay at that level. It's like they're themselves and they're not going to change. Like rotten to the core, like a sociopath, kind like a serial of, killer yeah, or someone that's... Kind of, just like that, yeah. And when I read those people, I touch on them and I move on because they're just... When I say dark, they're just not good people. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't want to even give them a second to talk because of some of the stuff that they did. I'm like, I don't want to give them. But to me, that stuff freaks me out because when they don't change, when they're there, when you're supposed to lift all your hate and you're supposed to lift like your pain, which happens, and they're still like a bad person up there, I'm like, that's scary to me. Like, yeah, I can imagine. That, yeah. How dark were they when they were exactly. here? Exactly. That's what freaks me out a little bit. I'm like, yikes. Like, Which I don't know why this triggers me. It's like, you know, in the movies they portray, where usually the darker spirits take possession yeah, of the yeah, medium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, is is there a thing like that? Where you, is that just movie play? I'm pretty sure that's just movie play. I know there's going to be people that are going to be like, that's not true. I've seen it. I mean, and I'm not discrediting anyone, but when I've seen people that were claimed to be possessed or had that, there was some type of mental illness that was associated that they, mm. like, said after. And that's... You know, that's their thing that they, you know, but I've never seen someone truly possessed mm -hmm. by anything. I've, you know, I have seen things where like things move and stuff like that. And to me, that's really scary. Like if I'm downstairs and there's no one home and I hear doo -doo -doo -doo, just like footsteps and there's no one home, I'm like, who the hell is that? Mm -hmm. And I go upstairs and I'm looking around I'm like, did someone break into my house? No one, nothing. That scares me because you, they give you sounds, smells, to try to like trigger you yeah, in here. yeah trying to get your the hair on your back to stand up mm -hmm. to let you know that they're there they want you to know that they're there and i'm like i can't do this anymore i'm like i'm sitting home watching tv and i hear doo -doo 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 -doo. i'm like i gotta go i'm oh, like going no. for a walk now <laughs> like because it's also head. another like you're in this other energy field and the power you have to conjure up or put together to then touch our physical reality right yeah. so like that's a powerful being it's it's i take this gift and i don't like um i'm very thankful for it and like i think because i'm able to do this i think there's people that maybe are not so thankful they mm -hmm. just view it as a certain type of way i am very thankful at first i wasn't i'm not going to lie at first i thought it was the biggest curse like I was like, I see things about my family, about what happened with my grandfather, with my aunt, that's horrific, mm -hmm. and other things. And I'm like, I, you know, I really wish I didn't see this about people. And then I realized, you know, after you say that hard thing, the healing begins for them, mm -hmm. and that's like a beautiful thing. And that's when I'm like, you know what, I am thankful for this. I'm thankful for like, you know, all the BS that, ha that came with it with my family, mm -hmm. with my friends, with all that. I'm thankful for it because it definitely made me have a thicker skin than 
I'm still very soft. I'm not going to lie. I'm very <laughs> sensitive, but um, definitely gave me a little bit of a thicker skin. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, so has this changed your relationship with death? Mm. And then what is your relationship with fear yeah. now? Because that's a whole different level of yeah. thing, right? You, at first you had the fear of taking on the, the power. Yeah. Then a lot of people do have a fear of death. Yeah. That's a fear I don't have just because mm. we're going to die. So why should I be afraid of something right. that's inevitable? Right. Granted, we don't know when. Right. But has that given you some other insight? And, and do you live a little freer? I definitely do. And I definitely am not f like fearful of death anymore because I know there is another place. And, you know, people that have these near-death experiences also share that experience mm -hmm. and just from doing the readings and being able to like say really specific things that no one knows that like people will say like you can't google it's a family issue that is not out there i'm like there is something there so it doesn't make me fearful the only thing that makes me fearful is from doing this is if i pass away at a young age or anytime soon you watch how your family's affected by it. And that's what I'm scared of. I don't want to see my family mm. being distraught, destroyed. I don't want them to go down a, like a path because I'm, I passed away. That's what I'm fearful of. I'm not fearful of actually passing away. I'm mm. fearful of watching them suffer from my passing. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. That's a whole new perspective. I've never even thought of because <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're bringing that space. Yeah. And then now I'm just thinking of, Suicide yeah. and the rates of suicide are incredible. Just they're yeah. just exponentially it's, growing, yeah. right? I heard there's this new stat: like 11 year old boys mm -hmm. are killing themselves yep. at a rate that you wouldn't even think is true. Yep. So like, if they knew the outcome of that impact, and you're right. watching the results, they wouldn't have done it. Because in most cases, it's like you're better off without me here. Right. And that's what a lot of people think. A lot of people think when I do, when I read these suicides from parent, I mean, it's always the parents that will come. The father is always the first one to come. The mom is not. It's always the father that will always be the first one to sit down with me. And it's, I will say suicide has been one of the more reoccurring readings that I've been having with children. Mm. And it's horrible. And you're right. If they could see what it's doing to them, they definitely would not because they would be better off here. They yeah. wouldn't be better off there, like 100% here. And I know it's hard to like even get into this and to go into it, but they, you know, with social media and stuff, it's, it's hard for them and life is hard. So if they just could see two years down the line that they'll be good, even two months down the line that yeah. they'll be good, like things would be very different. And that's what, you know, I try to tell the parents like it's not their fault because it's like, you know, a phone, a computer, Xbox Live, PS5. That's a whole different world yeah. that like no one even knows about. And like you can't like watch everything in every the session. chats within the game. Yeah, yeah, you can't do everything. So I try to and I know I can't do it, but I try to make them feel a little bit better about things. And I know I can't do it, but I hope that it's a step in the right direction. <laughs> them you think you'd ever write a book or something on this and be like yo let me start trying to help with this suicide epidemic or pandemic whatever the right yeah. word is no with I, some of this insight or something and i am yeah i definitely am getting um more serious about it i think you know when i first started doing this i'd never thought i'd be honestly in los angeles sitting down with you even sitting down with anyone doing this stuff and now that I have a platform and things like that, I think it's only right that I do something mm -hmm. like that. I don't think, I think if people have a platform, they should use it in the right way. Um, and that's kind of how I feel. I want to help people. I want to let them know, like, you know, I, yeah, I just want to give them insights. I, I, you know, it's a scary thing to even write a book, but I'm diving into it for sure. I know. I just committed to one. It's <laughs> <that's> scary. <laughs> yeah. It's scary, right? Like, yeah. It's a lot of work and yeah. it's, uh, there's multiple ways to do it. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, I'm going to swing for the big. You <laughs> yeah. can always backpedal down. Exactly. Exactly. Just got to come out the game hot yeah. and believe. That's kind of how I feel. I feel like if I'm going to do it, 
I'm going to set my mind to doing the best and biggest way. And then if it scales back down, like you're saying, I'm still cool with mm-hmm. it. Even if it changes three people's lives, I, you know, I feel like I won. Exactly. Like, I feel like I won. So that's kind of what, like, my mind is to that right now mm-hmm. is to do that, is to write something. And also I want to share, like, experiences of what I had in, like, this industry and then, like, you know, and personal life stuff and mix in everything with it. So... And I also want to tell people too, like, if you have this ability, don't be like me, like, don't shut it off for so long, mm-hmm. like embrace it. Because I think more people today embrace this gift than don't. I mean, there's definitely people out there that don't, but like I've learned and come to realize that many more people are into this than not. So mm-hmm. I would love to tell kids that are struggling with it because I was struggling with it mentally, you know, when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. So I could have really gone down a bad path you know, and I'm happy I didn't. And I want to help people. That's why if any parent says that they're kicking dude, I'm like, I'll jump on a call yesterday with you. I mean, like, I don't care. Yeah. Just like, let me help them. And that's, I, I always want to help. That's my thing. Yeah. We got to be in service to humanity, whatever our gifts happen to be. hundred percent. So what's, what's your definition of love now? Like you, you have a different perspective. Yeah. Is there, is there a different definition that you would give it? Is mm-hmm. there I'd be curious if you ever, I mean, come back and answer this later. Start asking some of these people that come back, like, what's your definition? As someone that paints love all over the world, I'm always curious, yeah. and I believe it's undefinable. I think that's, it's, you can't even put it into words. Like, and that's, and that's what I've learned. I've learned from reading people and the love that their families will come through or friends. I, I tell people this, I can't put it into words. Like, the love that they look at you, they stare at you, they talk about you, um, is I, I can't even fathom it and I can't put it into words. And I think my perception of love is consistency mm. and, you know, and just being there for people because the biggest thing I see with my readings is the non-consistency with loved ones and families and that breaks people mm-hmm. and they question love and then their whole life of relationships and self-love is shattered. And if you just have someone that's consistent and just tells you every day that they love you and they, they, they just want to be with you and through the good, the bad, anything, like to me, that's my definition of love, just mm. consistency. Yeah. And would you say consistency also with like bundled with presence and being present? A hundred percent. Being there, just, you know, just saying, what's up? How are you doing? Like, how, how was work? Just being there and being present mm-hmm. in, in their moments in their life. Like, that's huge. Mm-hmm. But like, and you're right. Like, presence is, like, another thing that should be with the consistency. Yeah, because you could be there, but not. Exactly. There. It's like, okay, my body's here, but I'm not here. Exactly. Like, they're here, but they're not even focusing on what's which going on. Which is confusing. On. Yeah, which plays with a lot of people with readings. They're like, they were there, but they were doing drugs in the back. and But, but they were there at my school play. Mm-hmm. It's like, but they did this, and that's not... You know, that's not the consistency part that you want. Like, by definition, I'm like, you want someone to be there and be like, yo, that was amazing. Like, what you did on your play, that was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Not going to the bathroom to score some drugs and then come in and be loopy for the next 45 minutes. Yeah. So, yeah, being there, being present, and actually, like, being physically present mm-hmm. and mentally present, too. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. I mean, I'm always challenging the definition of love, trying to figure it out. And I say it's undefinable, yeah. right? It's whatever we need it to be in the moment right. that we're in. 100%. And what the dictionary says, it's a strong feeling of affection. I'm like, no. Yeah, no and it no. isn't Valentine's no, Day, no, right? No, yeah. So I'm, I'm on this mission of like rebranding it, really saying you got to choose it. It's a choice. Right. So I like that you shared that. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, and I agree. I think it's whatever the moment is Mm -hmm. and then you feel that love i think that goes a lot longer way than someone pretending to to love you and then you're emotionally and mentally kind of scarred from that Mm -hmm. versus someone actually showing you that love in the moment of you graduating or getting your first job like like i know this sounds bad but even your first heartbreak your first like like job you get fired from like that love there translates a lot longer of 
someone just being like, yeah, I love you. You know, it's cool. Yeah. Or like, I bought you your first car. I'm like, okay, but that's not what I needed. Or exactly. Wanted. Appreciate it. Yeah. Appreci Thank you. For sure. But, Thank you for doing that. But, but I'm dealing with my stories and issues <laughs> yeah. here. In the Need card a hug. Yeah. yeah. Just give me a hug and we're good. Yeah. hundred percent. So, so let's talk about the juicy stuff, the stuff on TV, right? Yeah. yeah. People love watching their shows, reality shows, yeah. you know, their shows on cold cases yeah, and yeah. FBI specials yeah. and NYPD. So then you're doing some of that work mm -hmm. and things. What is that like to, A, be in that kind of limelight now? Is it mm -hmm. another type of pressure that's on you? And how do you navigate the situation is the cop coming to you and saying hey read this or yeah. does it just come to you and you call the cops yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like how does that that world work yeah so i think now that people know me for true crime stuff there's a lot of pressure i feel like i always have to perform when a case comes to me um but when typically how it comes with like the nypd or just like any thing i i mean i have families and like PIs will reach out to me. Mm -hmm. I have like over a thousand cases like worldwide from it. But when it comes to like the FBI or when it comes to NYPD, <clears throat> what they will do is they will be like, hey, do you have 15 minutes? Like I'll get a call because they, they don't want me to know anything about the case, to prep for the case, nothing. They're and testing the bullshit meter first. Exactly. And that's exactly how it was. My uh, first case was a very big case. And I only got that case because I read the lead detective's wife. So it was like the wife got the reading. She's like, you have to come to this kid. Like, you don't blah, blah, blah. And the guy was like, this is bullshit, dude. Like, he's like, whatever. I sit down. We do it. Leaves. Thought I did horrible. I'm very hard on myself with readings. I'm like pacing back and forth. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know. Um, and... A week goes by, calls me. He goes, the things you said about blah, blah, blah. He goes, I need you to do one for the cousin. And I was like, what? He goes, we're coming to you tomorrow. He goes, make time. And I was like, okay. So I do that. And then it kind of was word of mouth within the law enforcement community. And then now I'll get a call. They'll be like, hey, in 15 minutes, here's a Zoom link. We're blacking you out, changing your name, like the screen, altering your voice. We don't want you to know them and them to know you. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, fine, we do it. And then obviously from there, I do the reading. And then I get a little curious after about the case because that was my first, like, you know, the first reading. And then th they'll call me back the next week if things progress mm -hmm. or whatever. And then now that's kind of what they do. They'll just kind of throw me these big cases. And I also want to make this so clear to people i'm always their last call so don't i don't want people to think <laughs> i'm their first call yeah. like i'm literally when their back's against the wall and their case has another three months before like they have to shelf it until any new evidence before it comes goes cold, in. cold yeah the, i'm their last call so i don't want people to be like yeah like a case comes let's call jonathan like no they exhaust all their stuff and i'm their last stop and i try to kind of give them a different direction to go into. Just like what we said at the beginning, we're, you're almost everyone's last call of desperation. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, and like I've come to realize that I am their last, like everyone's last call like for that. And that's okay because I, it, I think I perform better when my back's against the wall than me sitting down in a comfortable environment mm -hmm. doing it. Um, and also I constantly with the law enforcement community, even though... I'm thankful that they truly believe in me now and stuff. I every time I do it, I still feel like I have something to prove. Yeah. So I kind of give them everything I got. Yeah. And for the audience, any of this stuff that's public, feel yeah. free to use the yeah the names that way you can, yeah. so they can go and look it yeah. up too. And we'll put some stuff in the show yeah. notes. So the Gabby Petito was my big, uh, I guess, claim to fame mm -hmm. with stuff. And then now the Long Island serial killer case been on it since 2017, and. Um, the one that just recently got posted that now I'm allowed to talk about is Sour Turney, her sister Alyssa Turney. Mm -hmm. She became, during COVID, huge on TikTok, trying to find her sister's like body and things about it, came to me for a reading, and she has a podcast show. And she wanted to incorporate both. I didn't know that. I thought it was just going to be one or the other. And she didn't air it. And I was like, what the hell? I'm like, I sat down with you for two hours. Yeah. And you, like, she like ghosted me. Like, I was like, what the hell? Turns out that the reading helped them arrest the father. 
like Ooh. that was like involved in it at that point. So those are my three big cases. That I mm-hmm. think people are more public. I mean, there's other ones that I'm working on currently with uh, NYPD and stuff um, that go back from the eighties, like oh, wow. they, they, they back in the eighties. And I've been working with the New York city DA's team a little bit here and there. And um, Suffolk PD, where the Gilligo stuff happened, mm-hmm. or Long Island serial killer. So yeah, it's been a bit of um, it's tough, I will say, because it's it's really heavy. I, yeah. And I think people think I have a switch I could turn on and off, and it's like I'm human, just like the next person. Yeah. And I think people forget that sometimes. But you're like, I have feelings too. Yeah. In fact, I'm a little more tapped into yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm I little, need a hug. Yeah. Can someone just give me a hug right now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So those are the cases that people know me about. Really, the Gabby Petito mm-hmm. and the mom just came out like a month ago. I I really just got permission to talk to her a month ago from the law enforcement people. So now we, we posted pictures together. We went out to lunch together. So now people are like, oh, my God, he was telling the truth. It's yeah. like, you know, I stopped speaking about it because they asked me to. And I don't know. I didn't feel right until like I spoke to Gabby's mom, mm-hmm. Nicole. And now she wants to do stuff with me. And, like, um, I don't know. It's just nice to get the validity aspect to for the people that were in my uh, messages being like yeah. BS. I'm like, yeah, no, but I can't really say anything on it. So I'm gonna keep my mouth shut and take the hits, but um, I know it's true. And now yeah. it finally came out and I'm like, thank you. <laughs> it's like, like, I took all this power to get out of my own medium closet, <laughs> yeah. but the world is still keeping me here. Yeah, yeah. There's a second closet yeah. for your closet. Yeah. But that's leading you to a TV show or something you've been working on yeah. for a little bit now. Yeah, so we had, um, with the strike and everything going on, definitely put a halt on it but we did a show which i spoke to you about um and it was about me going around helping out with these smaller cases Mm -hmm. and by smaller cases what i mean is these places in the united states like ohio and lima that has like 200 people Mm -hmm. and their police department has 14 people and after a certain amount of time they're like we don't have the resources so cold or you know unsolved whatever Mm -hmm. so i've been i was going around helping those cases more than like the large cases because from my perspective i want to help all cases but the people that don't have the resources or the people i kind of want to go and help yeah versus like lapd has all these resources nypd has all these resources so i want to help out the small Mm -hmm. guy versus the big guy do you think this that Community is more skeptic, though, mm. or more open? Oh, uh, way more skeptic. Like, 100% more skeptic. The but, small town minds. Yeah, small town. 100%. They're like, you know, um, and nothing against religion. It, they're like God's people, right? So yeah. they go to church every Sunday. They, it's heaven and hell. No one can even fathom speaking to the, to, to the dead. Once you're dead, you're dead. And those are the people that are hard to, like, um, I think it's hard for them to wrap their head around. Mm-hmm. I do read a lot of them. They'll come to me privately, but they won't speak about it publicly. Yeah. Like, it's always the people that are, like, in small town Georgia that have the thickest mm-hmm. accent, and they're like, don't tell mom that I'm here. Yeah. Like, I'm like, but your mom's coming through, so she kind of knows You know what's here. interesting, <laughs> though? If you look at the through line when you're very religious, right? it's faith. So yep. they're faith-based. So we're yes. not challenging faith. In Never. fact... You're proving how much faith you have by even coming to you to have exactly. the conversation. It challenges the constraints of religion. Right. But you're not even challenging religion. No, I try not. I, I'm literally not. And what I tell people, too, is when I read you, whether you're Catholic, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, mm-hmm. you guys all come through the same. Everyone comes through the same, and one's not better than the other. So I'm like, you know, when you go to that next phase in life, there's not just a section for you know, Christians, not a session for Jewish people, mm-hmm. you're all together and you all come through the same way. And I try to explain that to people. Um, but you know, I, I think it's hard for them to wrap their, I think it's hard for them to wrap their head around what just happened. Plus that too. They're like, mm-hmm. wait, what? I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm just the medium. I'm just the guy who's yeah. just relaying the messages, you know, don't shoot the messenger type thing. Cause the cha- challenge is everyone's got different views of death. hundred percent. Yeah. Different views of religion, different views of all the things. Yeah. So that's why. Yeah. And I try not to even like, you know, dip my toe in that with people. Cause I know how like, um, you know, they're very headstrong about it and I don't want to ever change someone's perception about anything. Mm-hmm. So if they want to believe that, then that's, until something, until real life happens, I've realized, then they change their beliefs. Yeah. But I try not to do that stuff. 
so shifting a little bit to yeah. more private clients. Yeah. Do you read people differently if they're celebrities versus regular people or like the Saudi royal family, for example? Okay. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff going on in yeah. Saudi culture. Yep. Like, how does that impact you or you just show up the same way and they take it however they take it? Or I literally show up the same way. Like I come in with a hoodie, a hat, a backpack, sit down and I don't change any type of reading. I think the only thing that's different between celebrity and a normal client is I feel like with a celebrity, their stuff is so public. So I, I stay away from anything like that. So, so they're even more skeptic or you're trying to thread that needle? I'm trying to thread that needle where it's like, you know, you talk about your grandma that passed. I'm going to talk to you about your makeup artist that you had when, with your first gig that killed himself versus your grandma mm. that is all over the news. Like that's where I go with people mm -hmm. that are, are like publicly out there because they could always come back and be like, this fucking kid Googled did this. And it's like, no, it's like, I'm going to pull in that makeup artist that you had for your first show or first whatever that you were tight with, that you dropped him like a bad habit because you got famous. Yeah. And like, you know, I'm going to focus on him. The cost of fame. Yeah, that's What's what the damage you've done on your way? Yeah, me? Not you. Oh, I'm yeah. saying, oh, I'm yeah. looking at... No, no, literally, I've, I have to be honest, reading those celebrities and stuff, like they from when i read people in their life that was before fame till after fame it's very different mm. like very different like you can see they're more excited about the people that came through before they were famous versus the people that grandma's coming through that saw the fame and it is a very interesting thing to mm. see that i've also seen like when i do readings and this is not for all celebrities but they're always like what's my next job like, they're not more so like, you know, that was awesome that my makeup artist came through. They're like, when's my next gig? They're like, do you see that? Like, so they just wrote off that whole... The whole thing at the end. They're crying, snot bubbles and all. And then at the end, they go, do, do they say anything about my next gig? And I'm like, where are we right now? <laughs> I'm like, what is this? Interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's why I, for a long time... I took a step back from not reading celebrities. I couldn't deal with it anymore. I mm -hmm. couldn't deal with like some of the stuff that was coming through. I mean, again, granted, it's not all of them, but I was just like, I'd rather focus on the people that truly need it and want it versus the people that want it for an experience. Yeah. Like, so I kind of shifted that and stuff. And because you could go to the gal on the corner, the guy on the corner with the neon signs, and yeah, you get you your guys experience. go there, yeah. yeah. Put your palms out and let them start rubbing it. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like, but I just realized, I think, from doing this now that there's people that need it versus people that just like want an experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I think now I'm more into the people that need it. And I don't think that's going to change. Like, mm -hmm. so that's why when like people reach out, like celebrities, I don't like put them in right away. I'm like, you have to wait just like the next person, which is like a long time. So I'm like, if you want it, great if you don't whatever yeah like i know it's bad but i kind of am more for the little guy than the big guy hey, you gotta do you yeah there's nothing wrong with that yeah right no i don't think so i think i would want that what are some like key takeaways and lessons that we as the audience could take from from you and your experiences yeah. let's let's write off that you're a medium yeah let's write off what we're talking about but you've had interactions you've had stories and yeah. we all take it that so it's like, how do, how do we face our fears? Yeah. How, what are some of the fears that are coming across in people? And what are things that you've done or learned that we can start facing them and moving past whatever's crippling us? Yeah. So the biggest thing I've, I've learned is um, with my fears is time heals everything in the sense of like in that moment, it's the toughest time and you're scared to do something or scared to take a leap. Think about like in three days when that interview, that something is over, you're just going to feel a lot better. And I, I think that's something that I struggled with. I was always trying to live in that like, all right, there's a time on Monday at one, like, and then I get myself crazed and scared. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I truly believe that, you know, time is everything and that if you're so scared about something, pushing yourself, just think about how when you do it the next day you're going to feel like always think about the next day you're going to feel so much happier that you took that chance you took that leap you did all of that mm -hmm. versus 
you sitting in that moment being like shoulda, coulda, woulda. Like, just do it, and then tomorrow you're gonna smile and be like, and just be like, I did it, you know? I did it, mm -hmm. and you know, it's in the universe's play now, it's mm -hmm. not my play. And I just think being adaptive too, like that's something I've learned. You can't be so, at least from me, with my fear, so tunnel vision. I'm like, I, this is it. Rigid, right? Yeah, tunnel vision. And then just be adaptive and just like go with the flow and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's worked personally. But yeah. I don't know if it works for everyone, but I hope someone can take it and apply to whatever it is. No, no, time is good. Hey, it's not that we have this finite amount of it. Right. But sometimes we need time to process, yes. to deal, to heal, to move on, to do the self-work. Right. It's not going to happen in a shift of, exactly. a, you know. Exactly. And then being malleable and adaptable, yep. flowing, because sometimes we have the tunnel vision. We right. are so rigid. We're so binary. We're right. so black and white that we lose sight of opportunity that's right in front of us. And it's so true because I tell people when you view things black and white, you're missing that gray area mm -hmm. in between and then the colors that come from the sides of it. And when I read people, I use that phrase actually. I'm mm -hmm. like, it's not black and white, there's gray area in between and then there's colors to the side. So I'm like, when you're reading or when you're talking to someone that's either right or wrong, but they, don't, they, they can't fathom like, hey, like maybe this person had a bad day mm -hmm. and there's that gray area. I think people need to be more understanding as well with things too. And be adaptive and going with the flow. Like, you just have to, like, you know, you can't be, like I said, so tunnel vision. Like, yeah. that's how I used to be. And it just was, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. Like, it was bad. And now that I, I, I'm trying, I'm still learning every day. I have not mastered any of this. But going with the flow has became a way easier way of life for me. Yeah. Than me being, like, tunnel vision. Boom. Mm -hmm. Go. Be like water. <laughs> yeah, be like water and flow. <laughs> and... Can love alone help heal people, cure them from some of these feels, from loss, from trying to connect with the past and move on? Yes. And I can say that in full certainty. Love will always help someone put the right foot forward and then continuing to do so. I think without love, honestly, in this scenario with like grief or whatever, people get lost mm -hmm. and people need that security of love mm -hmm. and that consistency like we spoke about. Love can definitely cure a lot. And then how much of that does self-love play into that or someone coming back to give that message of love? Have they ever said like, hey, do this, do more love? Yeah. So a lot of time, like there's been instances where like a loved one will come through and they'll just be like, you need to show a little bit more love to mm -hmm. they'll name like I'll be like, who's Nick? And they'll be like, that's my son. Like, You need to show more love to Nick. And they'll be like, what do you mean? I'm like, your father is saying that you're kind of doing your own thing, which I understand in life, you get carried away with stuff. And then I'll get an email being like, you know, my son's relationship in mine is now loads better, mm -hmm. like, because just being there in love. So I think, I think sometimes people need to hear it too. Yeah. And that's what I've, I needed to hear it. Honestly, I needed to hear from my family. I needed, you know, my fiance just to always tell me like, it's a securing blanket that, mm -hmm makes me feel confident and makes me feel strong and that I can pretty much conquer mm -hmm. whatever I want to conquer. Yeah, we need to be reminded. It's and you yeah. can't love someone too much. Right. You you can't. You could incorrectly love someone too much, Except, but that's a whole yeah, different thing. Yeah, that's a whole different thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but that's yeah. not what we're talking about. But yeah. we're just we're just pure real love. It's like yeah. just remind people, especially if you we forget. Yeah. We take things for granted. A hundred percent. And always just being like a kind person too. Like you don't have to say like to a stranger that you love them, but you show a smile and a kind mm -hmm. gesture, that type of love could change someone's entire mm -hmm. day mindset. They wanted to go home and maybe do something horrible to themselves. And then you, you do that one kind thing of like love and positivity, it changes their entire day. Yeah. And like you could have saved someone. And that's why I tell people, I'm like, you don't know what they're going through. So like maybe they're lashing out, but you don't even know what they're mm -hmm. going through. And that's what I take it now. So if someone's being an idiot, I smile. I'm like, dude, like this guy must be like really, really hurting right now. Yeah. And I'm not going to contribute to whatever it is. I'm just going to smile and move on. Yeah. And then I'll... I just try to tell people that because I think people, and especially more so men, I've seen someone does something to you. You're like ready to throw hands, ready to get like chest to chest, ready to go nose to nose. Yeah. 
And it's like, just smile and just walk away, man. That's, like, yeah, because that initial reaction yeah. is what gets you in trouble. Take exactly. a beat and go respond with a smile. Yeah, just be like, I hope you have a good day and just walk away. And then they're like, wait, what? Like, yeah. I just like told him to go F himself. He's told me to have a good day and smile. They're like, they're like what? And then maybe they think twice about next time. Mm -hmm. That's what I've been trying to preach to people. Yeah. So lastly, you know, a lot of us get bogged down with the days. Yeah. Um, we're either taking on people's energy, mm -hmm. expelling too much of your own energy, and we don't have a healthy balance with either restoring ourselves yeah. or clearing ourselves. Yep. What is your practice around clearing this energy, especially, mm -hmm. I mean, would you say you carry a lot of death energy when you're tapping in? Like, how are you getting rid of that? How can people then yeah. shake off negative energy they're taking on that they yeah. don't have the tools to actually yeah. acknowledge or clear so there's two things this the spiritual side of it is um i i get into a meditative state and i start doing like deep breaths but when i breathe it's gonna sound weird but when i breathe it comes out like dark smoke then i keep doing i keep doing it until i vision it being white and like white light smoke and then or whatever and then on the other side for me is always kind of being around people that bring me up. So mm. like my family, my fiance, Jess, like I'll go, I go for four walks a day, a run, I work out. I want to be outside. I want to feel that sun. I don't mm -hmm. care if it's hot, freezing, raining, snow, like being, I used to surf a lot and then I kind of stopped because there's a lot of sharks on yeah. Long Island. So, <laughs> I'll stay away yeah, from so I'm staying away from the water, but that was a huge thing for me. Yeah. I used to go and surf and then I would just sit on my board and just kind of let the waves bump me around a little bit for like 10 minutes. But I really think the spiritual side of like, you know, closing your eyes and envisioning that is huge because you're essentially cleansing yourself out of that negative death mm -hmm. type of or dark stuff. And you're in that meditative state. So when you're in that meditative state and you're doing that, your guides, your loved ones, whoever, they're helping you do it. It's kind of like a cycle. I always say you guys will have to breathe in to breathe out for air. You got to like cycle it out. But for me, it's the grounding with my family and everyone and mm -hmm. Jess and my fiance and going on 17 walks a day and, you know, working Find out. your anchor. Yeah, that is. That's I found it and it took a while to find it. I didn't know what it was. And I was like, maybe, you know, I go out with my friends and drink and try to like skew my mind that way. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, well, no, like, cause I'm like, that's kind of you know, starting a problem that I don't need. Yeah. And then I just realized being the people around me, like the close people around me to really like hunker me down, humble me, ground me, everything. Those are the people that I need around me after reading a murder case to reading a suicide in mm -hmm. one day it's like yeah because that's heavy it's so heavy and i don't lie to people like it does mess with me there's times where i need to like be alone mm -hmm. for a while like for like a night i need to like be alone like mm -hmm. i don't want anyone near me i need to decompress my own way of just sitting there and just thinking and just like getting my mind right yeah but then the other times is I try to use the sun. I try to use things like that to really, you know, recharge me a little bit. Mm. So you bring up Jess a lot. Jess is your beautiful fiance. She is. Yep. Um, this is probably more of a her question. Yeah. How is how was <laughs> dating? How it, yeah. is it different, dude? You, when we first started dating, um, I've had issues with dating in the past, catching people cheating with my gift and stuff like that, and I promised myself Wait, that's got it. Yeah, that's got to suck. Yeah, it, it really messed me up for a while where I was like seeing that stuff. And so I promised myself two things because the the person before Jess, the girl before Jess, she used me for it was pretty evident for one, my gifts, but two, the people out in L.A. who I knew and that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I promised myself I wasn't going to tell the next person I was medium until I knew for a fact that I, I see a long term relationship with the person because mm -hmm. A couple things could happen, like I said. So we were sitting outside. We were going to L.A. the next week, <laughs> literally. And I was like, this is the time. And I knew I loved her before. So I knew I loved her. And I was like, you know, I see myself with her. So I told her. I mean, it looked like a bat hit her in the face. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, I mean, like, you know, she looked at me like I had seven heads. Like she was like, poof, poof, like someone just like rocked her. And how long were you dating at this point? <laughs> like three months. Okay. But we were talking for like 
a while, like six, seven months, but she, you know, kept going to Florida for two months at a pop and I was in New York. So yeah. I'm like, you know, we can only communicate through the phone. So it was like, I need, you know, a little bit more. And I'm sure she did as well too, but we spoke every day. But so when I told her, I could tell, I was like, I can't just like say it. I have to like, you know, say some stuff. So I pulled in a family member of hers that, you know, she's Colombian. So I knew that her family was religious. Like it, like they had their, their thoughts. And so I, I brought someone in that took their own life that on her side of the family, it's like they did not speak about because um, like I could tell they, it was just not spoken about. Like mm. you don't, you don't bring it up. And I explained like how it exactly happened. And she's never mentioned this person to me ever. She barely mentioned too, too many people in her family anyway, because we were just starting. Yeah. But this person, I knew for a fact that now that I'm engaged to her, her family still would never talk about this dude to me ever, still to this day. So when I said that, she starts hysterically crying. She's like, I need a minute. What the hell just happened? Like, you know, she's like, I, she goes, I really didn't believe it. She's like, I literally never spoken to this about you. Mm -hmm. And since then, I mean, she's she would have always been my biggest supporter. But since then, I mean, every time I come to L.A., I, you know, I'm the most stressed human. And um, she brings me down and she's the most helpful for me. But at that time, I mean, it looked like someone hit her with a bat. And then I said that. And then she was poor. She was crying. And we didn't speak for like two hours. We we're sitting on the couch. And I'm like. Do I say something? <laughs> like, <laughs> do I touch her knee? <laughs> yeah. Do I grab her hand? Like, yeah. what do I do? I'm like, I'm gonna give her this moment, and then eventually she like start talking about. It. I'm like, all right, thank God. <laughs> I'm like, thank God. But and now she's your fiance. Now she's my fiance. I'm the luckiest person in the world. Amazing. Yeah. yeah Amazing. Thank you. There's one thing I kept wanting to ask, and yeah. now it's still in my head. Yeah. Do you need to be face to face to read people? Because yeah. you, you've mentioned Zooms and yeah. phone calls, and the, and then how does that actually work then? Yeah, so I I mainly do through Zoom now because I'm I'm very thankful my clients are all over the world and yeah. stuff. Um, but I need to be on like a call or a Zoom. I prefer Zoom just because I'm able to like. I feel like it's more of a personal connection over Zoom like talking you in the got beginning, visual, yeah. like a visual versus like a phone call. And I just, you know, I want people to leave with that personal like feeling versus like a transaction mm -hmm. and me just doing my time and being all right, bye. And just like hanging up. But yeah, it's, it's a trip that I can do it through zoom. Like it's a trip. Like, Is that because you're very powerful and good at it or? I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it's because we can move at the speed of light. Like I was saying, so I'm yeah. able to like connect but, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't is know. in person like extra strong, extra powerful? Or? I would probably say so. Yeah. I think when I'm in person and not when I'm in the zone and we're sitting and it's, you know, whatever things are, it's one more person, personable and two it's or personal and it's, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it comes in like, boom, like, whoa, like, which is, I don't let people come to my house anymore because, uh, unless I know them. I don't want strangers coming in anymore. Like Yeah, that's that's very yeah. personal. Yeah, like and I used to do that. I used to have people come in every day, just coming in and now I'm like, no, I can't do that anymore. Like I just can't I do it. I feel like they would leave remnants or re residue behind and starts building up. Yeah, I had to sage and stuff and like and listen, I'm like a medium, but I'm like the least spiritual person. So like me even saying sage, I'm like, whoa, but it's true though, when you sage and you do that, you feel the light and stuff and like the lightness in the room, just, mm -hmm. just like a little Palo Santo. Yeah. Or... Something. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing, for being open. Oh, thank you. If, uh, there was one thing to leave everyone with that can say, you know what, give this an opportunity, give this a shot. What would you say it is? Is there a moment or is there, Hey, one day you never know. Like with being a medium. Mm-hmm. I coming would, to see you or... Oh, yeah. I would say when you're ready, I would never force anyone to come. And I would say when you're ready and you need it versus an experience is a little different, like we've been saying. And I've noticed when people lose someone very important to them, they want to come. And my only thing is, which is people would say it's bad for business, but I don't really care. You need to do the human grieving process. You should not be coming to a medium 
immediately after someone passes away. Grieve first, deal with that. And then if you want that as like an additional thing later on, mm. by all means, my door is open and any medium's door is open. But my suggestion is when that moment happened, when that moment happens, which is will be unfortunate and we all deal with it, please, please, please grieve like as a human. Don't yeah. don't rely on any medium. Grieve as a human and get through it as a human yeah. and then go to the medium. That's my biggest thing, Deal which is bad for that. business, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but whatever. But you're not in it for that. You're no. in it to be of service. And yeah. that's a good that's a good point. So Jonathan. Yes. Final question. Mm-hmm. There's no right answer. Yeah. There's only your answer. Yeah. How do you define living a life through love? How do I define living a life through love? I think I think my answer is which I live by is always helping out even when people aren't looking. That's my thing. You don't need a camera, you don't need to post it. Who cares? Just help out when no one is looking mm -hmm. because that goes a lot longer of a way than a camera in someone's face and you posting it. That's kind of my thing now is doing mm -hmm. things behind that because that's more meaningful. Yeah. Do it whether it's on or whether it's off. Yeah, 100%. It doesn't matter. If you're walking down a Starbucks, always be that loving, helpful person and help and then move on. Mm-hmm because you just help someone. You don't need to record it, write it, tweet it, whatever. Just do it. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's my biggest thing. Yeah. Awesome. And where can everybody find you? Um, Jonathan Mark Medium, my Instagram, and I guess my TikTok too now, Jonathan Mark Medium, same thing. Those are my two biggest social media platforms. Don't have anything more, which is sad, but I'm trying. <laughs> hey, little by little. Little by little. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for thank so much you, for sharing. Man being here with us. Thank you so much for tuning in to Live Through Love. If you love this episode, you'll love this episode.